and it is in that name, above all names, the name of Jesus Christ, that I greet you. And of course, his name is what identifies him, but his person, his work, his gift of eternal life is what identifies us in him. But lovely to have you with us. And it's Grace Now Bible Church, Grace Now Ministries. I'm Paul Weiss, V-I-C-E, which is not the best name for a minister because Weiss is normally like Miami Vice. It's the Miami's problems. <laughs> but we're going to be listening to Tom Brichet again. And I'm not going to do a message as such, but I'm giving this as an intro. I must tell you, just to keep you updated, that we have applied for a place to have fellowship. And in the words of the lady that I contacted, she said, yes, they had a meeting. They were positive. They were, she used the term, it was a thumbs up. Jolly good. Anyway, they've got to just finalize one or two little things. And if we get this facility, we will be having fellowship again. And what we will do is we'll either have a message like this or we'll send live Facebook feedback, but it will be recorded. It will be presented. And of course, our ministry is about teaching. Now, many people say, well, I don't want to teach. I just want to go and worship. If you don't know who you're worshiping, let me tell you, your worship is a waste of time. And that old adversary, the enemy of God named Satan, he rubs his hands and he says, ah, they just want the experience of worship, but they don't even know who they're worshiping. And that's something that I had such a stunning, stunning conversation where a young girl by the name of Sade had questions about how does God work? What is he doing? What happens here? What the stunning, stunning questions. And she's served the Lord for a long time. She's been reading the King James Bible, which is, of course, a good thing. But she hasn't been able to necessarily get the key to why she can read so many different things. And sometimes it doesn't make sense. So we spent quite a bit of time together with her mom, Bronwyn, and I must say that I was really taken aback by her desire to know the Lord, her, I'm going to call it obedience to the Lord, but it's just desiring to please him. And obedience is not a good word in the English language, because it almost implies that you go to a training course like a dog, and then you obey your master. No, 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 no. It's the joy of serving and loving our Lord and just not being able to keep quiet about the grace that has changed our lives. So it is never just service. Now, I know that the word service is used in the scriptures, but what we do to serve the Lord is never an obligation. It's what I might call a joyful blessing to be able to live for the Lord, because there are others that you have concern about. Now, having said that, I also want to just mention, and I'm mentioning by name because some of these folks may watch it, but there's there's a guy called Stuart and his son Nicholas, and um, I must say, and it was absolutely amazing, and I'm going to show you if you're watching the video. Do you know what this is? Now, the video may not be that good. I'll try and get it a bit closer. <laughs> but do you know what this is? It's known as a Christ thorn bush. And it's got plenty of thorns on it. Now, one of the stunning things is that when I visited his home, Stuart's home, where his son was staying before he actually moved into a place that I, I, I rent. Um, and do you know that for the first time in my life, he had these little Christ thorn bushes. And do you know, I've only ever seen them in red and he had them in yellow. Now, I don't know what color that is, but I went there the other day just to drop something off, and he had found this growing in the garden, and he took it out, put it in a pot, and gave it to me. And I just want to say thank you. And I can't once again express enough thanks to those for the last two years or year and a half have been just overwhelming in their love of the Lord, their support of the teaching of God's grace. And you know what? I don't thank you personally. I appreciate it personally, but I thank you for your desire, your, your wish to know more about the Lord, to understand his word. Now, what I'm going to do next week is that I am going to speak to you and I'm going to do a sermon. And I don't know whether we'll be in a fellowship yet. Um, maybe it'll be the week after that. Um, I know they're having a meeting on the 24th of May. 
but they said they may finalize it before the main board meeting. And if they do, we're going to start as soon as we can, because I must say that I miss the conversations. I miss the fellowship with men and women who just love the word of God, because it reveals the Lord of truth, who is Jesus Christ, his work, and God our Father, and the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Now, what I'm going to deal with next week, and I'm just, I think I might have mentioned this before, and unfortunately, I've had to change my office a bit. I work from an office that is actually um, a container as such, but I've done a bit of changes and things. And what I want to speak to you about is the question that also came up yesterday, and I'm going to try and make a list of those questions, and that is, can a Christian be possessed by a demon? Now, I'm going to give you a straight shooter answer where you don't have to necessarily figure it out. But I'm going to say, no, a Christian cannot be possessed by a demon. The King James Bible doesn't even use the word demon. But can a non-believer be possessed by a demon? My answer there, I don't believe so. No, why? Because... God used signs and wonders and cast demons out when Christ was on the earth so that he could say he and show that he had a spiritual power. Jesus Christ had the authority of God, a spiritual power, even greater than, this, than the, the, any form of spiritual entity, including Satan himself. And remember, Satan is not able to be in many places at once. He can only be in one place. He's a created being, and God is going to throw him into the pit of fire for the rest of eternity. He's going to cast him into hell forever and ever. But going back to my question, can we be possessed as Christians? No. Can a non-believer be possessed? No, I don't believe so. They can be influenced by the, the lack of truth. Now, I'm not saying they're influenced by evil, but a lack of truth is deception especially when you think it's truth and it's not. That is Satan's target. And that is why there's such a debate about the versions of the Bible, about what does the Bible mean? That's your interpretation. No, the Bible only has one interpretation and that's itself. Yeah, but that's your opinion. No. And the three points that I'm going to share with you next week for those of you who are listening and who are keen is this. Number one, you've got to know the distinctions of the scriptures of who it's written to, why it's written, what it's saying, whether it's actually a sign and wonder statement, or whether it's Paul's gospel of the gospel of the glory of God's grace. That's number one is the distinctions. Number two is the strategy. If you don't understand strategy of the enemy, you're going to fall short because the truth sets you free, but the truth highlights deception. So, and let me put it to you this way, and I think that Tom Brichet used a similar illustration. I've used one for a long time, but I've adjusted it a little bit. And that is that my, my um, son-in-law, Zane, was an under-19 junior springbuck, and he was a top-of-the-range squash player in the border area in the Eastern Cape. And you know what? When he played a game of squash, not only his coach and his dad, who was instrumental in just going to the court and just feeding him ball after ball that he could practice shots. But you know what? If you're going to play somebody, whether it's a team sport like rugby, whether it's cricket, what do you do as a bowler, as a team member, is that you strategize of what you think the other team, the other individual is going to do. And that's why we don't study, study Satan, but we do see what his strategy would be that we can never be taken into deception. And that's where Ephesians 6.11 is a beautiful, beautiful verse. 2 Corinthians 10.5, another beautiful verse. Don't let the stronghold of the way you think take you prisoner. Ah, oh, there's so much that I could say, but I'm going to keep it to that. And the last point I'm going to make next week, and I'm going to share these three points. If you want to hear it, Please 
give information to others and I'm going to deal with a question and I'm going to verify that you cannot be possessed by a demon. You cannot have a demon cast out of you. And you'll say, but so many people are doing it. Well, if you're going to take that and it works, then please be fair enough to say that the same scriptures that say Jesus could cast a demon out of someone are the same scriptures that say he raised the dead, that the blind after all their lifetime, young man could see. So if you're going to take the one, take all of them. But let me tell you, the third point I'm going to make is that it, the psychology of believing you could be possessed by a demon is deadly. And I'm going to give you the reasons for that. And you know what I'm going to say as well, which I'm going to incorporate, is that the psychology rests massively on the deception of not getting the right scriptures that are not written to you as much as those that are written to you. And here's the kingpin is that you have to also be a person who has a superstitious mind who will believe something because of what you think, what you experienced. But you have to ignore the word of God, the details of words. And as I say, that's what I'm going to deal with. But I want to greet you. I want to say thank you for those of you who have listened to messages like Tom Bruchet, but also thank you for your love of the Lord. You will never, ever, ever be able to give a gift to God more than your heart. And that is desiring his truth, knowing his truth. And some of you might have dedicated millions of rands to constructing a church or doing that for God's glory. Now, practically, that's wonderful. But if your heart ain't right, sometimes people give to justify their wrongs. And they say, Lord, look, you know what? I do do things wrong. But look, I do contribute to your work. Now, I'm touching on some of the most important things you can imagine. And you may say, well, you know what? That's not important. It's vital. Because if you think you're doing something to please God and you're wrong, again, and I use this expression or this illustration often, say it leans back and he says, hmm. That guy's giving this, he's doing that, and he thinks that he's pleasing God, but his heart is not interested in the distinctions of the word of God, the differences. He's not interested in the strategy of Satan, of just being wise to it. And that's where the Bible says that we need to know the wiles of the devil, which is the methods of trickery or deception. And then, as I say, it's going to be the strategy as a second point, and then the psychology, which I'll explain in an illustration, and also the superstitious mindset that leads people into those things. And you know what? They believe that it's true. They believe they had the experience. But don't you wake up sometimes and you've had a dream and it feels like reality, you've got the emotions. Maybe your subconscious mind is actually reading something and responding. Now, I've given you a little insight into what I'm going to cover next week. But please, enjoy Tom Bruchet. He's a teacher of note. He's a fantastic-hearted man for the Lord's Word. And take a pen and a pencil and learn from him. And you know what? I want to say, I mentioned Bronwyn and Sade, who I met with yesterday. Can I tell you? A 17-year-old young lady wanting to know the Word of God. She ranks amongst the highest of the high in wisdom because it is not intelligence it's not achievement it's not status it's not anything but the heart that the lord is interested in first and then the growth in the understanding of god's word first not experiences not doing good things not our works but the heart that first of all wants to know more about god's word and secondly is burdened for others to know this truth that has set us free. And I'm going to take a well-known verse as I close this brief message. Um, and that is that I'm going to actually take a verse that I, I quote quite often. It's a well-quoted verse by Grace School of the Bible, by Richard Jordan, and by the people who have been instrumental in teaching not only me the last four or five years, but thousands of people worldwide through Grace School of the Bible. And the reference that is made 
is to a beautiful passage. And I shared this yesterday with the family that I met. Um, and listen to these beautiful words, but listen to the distinctions, the strategy, the psychology, and the superstitious mentality that is undone in these verses. And I'm just going to very briefly explain them. And my message has been a bit longer than I thought, but I think it always is. <laughs> Um, and that is 1 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14. And Paul writes, the guy who writes to us is Paul. Every book starts with the word of his name, Paul, an apostle of, to give that distinguish. I'm going to touch on that next week. But listen to what he says. And I'll start from verse 12. Verse 11. As you know how we exhort and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children. What a beautiful expression. That's you. God wants you to be fathered by him as a father does his physical children. Um, then he goes on and he tells you why. That you would walk worthy of God who has called you unto his kingdom and glory. Now, God's kingdom on earth was via the nation of Israel. But God's kingdom is the entirety of the universe as such, but as all of humanity and everything, but only those who trust in him are saved and know him. Anyway, and then it says, for this cause, what cause? That you would walk worthy of God. Ah, oh, that's what we want to do is walk worthy of God. Gratitude will always be the foundation of that. Not working, but gratitude for salvation, for being saved, that you're not going to lost eternity. Why? Were you a good person? No. Christ was a fulfillment of a satisfactory and sufficient sacrifice on our behalf where he paid the, the penalty of sin. And that's what learning the word of God is about. It's not learning so you can do something. It's learning that your heart just bubbles over and you can't remain silent about telling people of this amazing grace that you're going to heaven. You could never deserve it but it's a gift God gave because he loved us. And then he goes on and says that you would walk worthy of God who has called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also, also thank we God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, that's Paul and the others that were with him. Hang on, but didn't you hear it from the other 12 apostles? Didn't you hear it from Jesus? No, this is a unique message that is distinguished from that and he says that you received the word of god which you heard of us you received it not as the word of men not as if i said it but that in this is where it goes that's so beautiful but as it is in truth the word of god which effectually worketh also in you that believe in other words paul says it's not the word of men that i've shared with you Hang on, but it came from man. No, it was the word of God through a man. And then he says, that effectually worketh also in you that believeth. Now, that is so amazing. Because he doesn't say, it also effectually worketh in you who believeth what Jesus taught to the nation of Israel. Yes, of course we believe that. But it's not written to us. The message he's talking about is what he calls the revelation of the mystery. The mystery of the grace of God preached and pronounced that you do nothing but trust Christ and you are saved. No repentance, no baptism, no kingdom of heaven on earth, because we're going to heaven, not earth. Now, I know I've touched on a lot of things, said a lot more than I was intending to, <laughs> but I hope that is meaningful to you. And when we start our fellowship, if you in the local area, or even if you travel to come and visit us from Cape Town, Joburg, Pretoria, East London, it doesn't matter you might be able to come through and visit with us. We are planning to have a conference once COVID slows down. But in the meantime, if you're listening to this, prepare yourself. Start to think it through. Read Ephesians 6, 11. Read more. Read the whole chapter. Read the whole book. Read it quite a few times. And that's what I said to this very precious young lady, Sade, is I said, take the book of Romans and read it through. Read it through read it through. And when it sounds confusing, just keep reading it. And you know what? The pieces start to fall in place. And suddenly you read something, you think, hang on, but that's what was said earlier in, a, in this context. And you know what? The first 11 chapters of Romans are dealing with doctrine. Chapter 12 begins with, now make your life a living sacrifice. 
and live for the Lord. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I read last time I spoke. That is just the foundation. And man, I can't wait for you to join in studying with me. Because you know what? When I study it, I see new things. Not that they change anything in terms of the doctrine, but they're just new concepts that I've never thought of before. And that's exactly how the Lord works. And I'm saying to you, may your study of the word of God ignite that flame inside that you know is not ignited by you, but you can't put it out. You want everybody to know it because how can they not know how beautiful this gospel is? <laughs> may the Lord bless you, which he has done if you're saved. And if you're not, trust in Jesus Christ and just believe the evidence, which is important, but you've got to study it to get the information behind it to have complete evidence. But just trust, Jesus Christ died for your sins. He was buried, had no sin of his own, and that's why death couldn't hold him personally. And he rose again. And his resurrection is the evidence that he died in our place. And God counted his judgment of our sins upon Christ. And then once the debt was settled and sealed, we can trust him and he wipes the slate clean. And when we stand before him, he will never ask about our sin. He will ask about our works. In Our works will firstly have to do with a study of his word, not feeding the poor, clothing them, doing a thousand things for people, but not knowing what the distinction is. The strategy is, the psychology is, and the superstitious mentality to that. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.